today on the Andrew Cooper Writer Show, the House Republicans here in Kentucky, Kentucky House Republicans, would rather spend $114,000 in order to fund infighting within their own primary caucus instead of doing their job, showing just how incompetent they are. Because we have once again, this is something I discovered when I was digging through those contracts, we've once again a perfect example of the legislators who stood up there this last session claiming they want to fight DEI, turning around, approving it, funding it, without saying anything about it. We'll be going over that. On top of that, they're funding their enemies, funding the very people who are going after Donald Trump through the legal system. We'll talk about that. And then also, uh, we will have the uh, Democrat Party is not revealing the names of their electors going to the national convention, who the delegates are. I'll tell you why this is absolutely bonkers, crazy, ridiculous, stupid. I'll just, you know, all the adjectives that mean stupid, uh, you can attach to that. So we'll have all that and more today on the Andrew Cooper Writer Show. Of course, as always, please make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe wherever you're listening at. If you can do those things, make sure you've done them. But one thing you can always do if you're listening on uh, the podcast formats, especially on iHeart, I believe, uh, Apple, and Spotify, is you can leave a review of the show that helps spread the word. And then also you can do the little bit of hard work it takes to tell others to tune into the show, to tell them to subscribe, tell them to throw it into their rotation of what they listen to every day because, you know, we're getting pumped full of information about what's going on nationally. You can see it on Twitters, you can see it on the Facebooks, you can see it on the news every night, but what you're not getting is the kind of commentary and information you need on Kentucky politics. Because I tell you what, for example, the first story we're talking about today, no media is going to talk about this. Nobody else is talking about this other than a, a few conservative podcasts that maybe come out once a week or so. Or there's one particular one regionally in Boone County, the Jill and Stacy show, that'll talk about this kind of issue. But you got to be doing the digging and the hard work. You're not going to find these just by cruising the Herald Leader's website. And, and that's the kind of work we are willing to put in on this show, but also other people around the state on their weekly shows are willing to put in. This is the only show that comes out daily. But the way you say, hey, thank you for bothering to watch and care and do that hard work uh, that comes along with holding our government accountable is to go ahead and tell others to tune on in. But without further ado, let's dig down into it. So there is a company out there called Panorama Education. Now I've talked about it before on the show, but it's been quite some time. And it was a pretty big deal when I talked about it on the show before. I know many of people, I posted about it, for example, online, and it got many shares, many views, and everything else. I had many legislators reach out to me, and I've talked to many legislators, including legislators on the contract review committee, but apparently it didn't make it through into their brains to realize that that's a company to watch out for. And why is Panorama Education a company to watch out for? Well, because it is a DEI company that is founded by Merrick Garland, Joe Biden's head of the DOJ, Joe Biden's attorney general, Merrick Garland, the guy who's taking Trump to court and, and going after him with the political system, that guy's department, his son-in-law founded Panorama Education. And what they do is they, they specialize in DEI type surveys. But the very action surrounding this company and the amount of districts and schooling places that are picking them up, potentially trying to curry political favor, raise so many eyebrows that the Missouri AG actually demanded a investigation back in 2022. This is from Fox News. Merrick Garland's communications with the company's son-in-law co-founded demanded in Missouri AG investigation. So such improper behavior coming out of this company, the Missouri Attorney General had to take steps to look into it. But despite that, Kentucky continues to do business with it. And you would think that the Republican, just from a sheer tactical standpoint, let's throw aside right and wrong for a second, because we know many of these politicians, they don't give two flying figs about what's right or what's wrong morally. Let's just talk about what you should be doing 
tactfully. And tactfully speaking, continuing to funnel taxpayer dollars into the pockets of people who then turn around and donate and fund your would-be political opponents is literally, tactfully speaking, incredibly stupid. You would think just from a sheer political survivorship, from just a sheer point of, hey, look, we want to survive on the political stage, you don't give money to big Democrat donors, big Democrat funders, people who are part of the Democrat system that will fight against you if you're a Republican. You'd think they would at least do that. Sure, that is, I would agree, that's probably a corrupt reason to go ahead and not give money to somebody just because you don't like their politics. I'm not saying I personally would advocate and look at somebody's politics. I would only be looking at a, a vendor's politics when I'm thinking about why did they get a no-bid contract or something like that. But I'm not a legislator. I'm somebody with a little bit morals that apparently than most people in politics. Not some. Some legislators do have great morals, but a lot of them don't. And so I'm not there. So... To those who are there, if you can't do it, if you can't get off your butts because it's the right thing to do, if you can't do it because you actually care about this DEI garbage being shoved down the throats of kids in our schools, you think you would at least do it to make your political fights just a little bit easier, a little less funded opponents. But of course, they don't do that. But anyways, putting that to the side. So we've got a company that uh, has potentially inappropriate uh, relationship with the government due to the son-in-law, uh, uh, the, the founders is the son-in-law of the uh, federal attorney general Merrick Garland under Biden. So you think that would raise some eyebrows. Maybe that would ask us to lead some questions, but no, they went ahead and just waved this contract on through. But let's pretend for a second Panorama Education is not owned by Merrick Garland's son-in-law. Let's just pretend that it's just a company on its own. Well, just alone with what they do should lead you to say, hey, we're not approving any of these contracts. Take a listen to, this is, this is just a chunk of their video explaining what they do. And let me see if you see the problems. Let me know, sorry, if you see the problems in it, like I do, go ahead and take a listen. Once Panorama surveys have been administered, the platform offers easy to use analytics so you can quickly move from receiving feedback to understanding your data and taking action. The surveys platform offers powerful dashboards to help you monitor your response rates in real time and to track how responses have changed compared to previous surveys. Identify gaps across race, ethnicity, grade level, gender, or custom attributes to understand the experiences of these groups and analyze survey data with an equity-based lens. An equity-based lens. Hmm. So it sounds maybe nice enough if you don't have the trained ear, but what they're doing is they're uh, furthering the DEI concepts by offering these surveys to both students and teachers in order to determine whether or not your school is properly DEI'd up enough. Now remember, this is the same legislation where both chambers passed a bill banning DEI in college. One of the legislators proposed a bill banning DEI in K through 12 education. You think that would have been the first thing they would do rather than college because it's optional to go to college, not optional to get a K through 12 education. Um, so you think they would go ahead and deal with that first. And there's of course a lot more state funding into the K through 12 education system. There also is into the college system too. So don't get me wrong, but anyways, putting all those questions to the side. Um, so they say they're against it. And, and so to a trained ear and you hear that, you start to get uncomfortable. And so I actually bothered to look. Now, the specific contract that they're getting from the state that was approved back in July is for $275,000 in order to provide funds to conduct a voluntary, anonymous, and confidential full population survey of public school teachers and administrators designed to gather information on school working conditions. Now, before I go into the survey they hand out, let's go into the first problem with said survey. And the first problem you have is voluntary. Now, if you're actually trying to do a survey, and, and, and I'm not saying this, it should, we shouldn't be doing this survey at all, it's stupid. 
it's a waste of $274,000. I'll go into what the survey asked that makes it even dumber and even more waste of money. But just from a sheer like data standpoint, okay, if I'm trying to actually collect data on what the actual working environment is like within a company, and so I'm gonna send out a survey to the employees, it would not, I would make it confidential, but it would not be optional. I would not let it be optional. Because the only people responding to the surveys then will be the people who have really big gripes with the workplace. You're not going to get the people that are like, meh. And you're not going to probably get a whole lot of people that are like, no, it's great. I love it here. No, every time, and, and, and anybody who works in business, anybody has, that works in marketing, anybody that works in reviews too, that, that, that works in a company that receives reviews knows for every negative uh, 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 positive review you get from a customer, you're 10 times more likely to get a negative one. Because customers are a lot more likely to complain if they get a negative experience, then they are to go ahead and leave a positive review if they get a positive experience. 10 to one ratio. And it, it carries over into the workplace too. If you're having a positive or neutral experience in your workplace, you're a lot less likely to fill out a voluntary survey than somebody who's absolutely upset with their company, with the company they're working for and saying, you know, and I, I don't really want to do I don't actually like working here. They're gonna fill out a pretty horrible survey. So just from a sheer data standpoint, it's already useless. But let's look at what the teacher survey questions are. And this is from the page. I had to go on to Panorama's website and uh, had to give them uh, uh, an email and some other things in order for them to provide me a PDF of what the Panorama teacher survey user guide and they give you example questions from each topic to give you some idea of what they'll put together into the questions. And, and so this is from their page, from their example surveys uh, called Educating All Students, Teacher. Okay, these are the questions asked. You ready? Uh, just, to, just to go on to a few of you here, a few of them here. How easy do you find interacting with students at your school who are from different cultural backgrounds than your own? How comfortable would you be incorporating new material about people from different backgrounds into your curriculum? How knowledgeable are you regarding where to find resources for working with students who have unique learning needs? If, a st if students from different backgrounds struggle to get along in your class, how comfortable would you be intervening? Which, it, pause there, that is a crazy question if you think about it, because it would imply that if you're seeing conflict between two different uh, uh, people, it simply stems from the fact that they are come from either racial or religious backgrounds or different genders. It, it literally quantifies every single conflict down into immutable characteristics rather than about personalities. Because it's not talking about how easy would it be to help you know, two kids with different personalities get along. That would be a reasonable question. But asking, well, are you comfortable if a black kid and white kid are fighting each other? Do you feel comfortable intervening? Because clearly they're racist. At least you think, well, maybe it doesn't have anything to do with race. Here's the uh, next question. In response to events that might be occurring in the world, how comfortable would you be having conversations about race with your students? Because that's something you, 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 know, you want to know. If in a work environment, do you feel comfortable talking about race with your students uh, in light of recent events? Do you feel comfortable, you know, interjecting your politics into the classroom, basically? How comfortable would you be having a student who cannot communicate with anyone else in class because of his slash her uh, home language was unique? That's a weird question just because, you know, even if their home language was Spanish or French or anything else, what unique? There's like... No language can be unique. I mean, by definition, it has to be a language other people speak, at least in a pretty good quantity. But anyways, when a sensitive issue of diversity arises in the class, how easily can you think of strategies to address the situation? That's, that's like real questions. Those are just the example questions that they're giving you. In this survey, the D equity and DEI teaching. 
So not only are we giving $275,000 to Merrick Garland's son-in-law to conduct surveys that are asking questions that we shouldn't care about, nor should ever be asked of a teacher, that also has a methodology that literally will lead us to no good information at all because it's voluntary uh, 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 answering. And this contract just gets waved on through by the Republican Contract Review Committee. As I talked about in my last show, there are things they could do to stop this, make it clear that, that they're not going to let this keep happening, but they failed to do it. This got waved on through. They never asked another question. Bad methodology, bad questions, giving money to bad actors, 275K. That's probably more than most of y'all's household incomes. They just, eh, who cares? Absolutely ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. But what they do have time to do, instead of looking into that, they do have time to provide $114,000 to uh, uh, an in-kind contributions to the Conservative Commonwealth Coalitions PAC. So for those of you who've listened to the show for a long time, you've heard of this PAC before. For those of you that are new to the show, just listening, didn't listen to the show through this last spring's primaries, let me tell you about this group, the Panorama, or Panorama, the um, Conservative Commonwealth Coalition was funded by uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars from the teachers unions in Jefferson County, hundreds of thousands of dollars from the horse parks, as well as good chunks of money from some developers in Northern Kentucky that don't like some of their reps. And uh, it was also donated to, you know, uh, 10, 15 grand here or there by some other big name organizations. I'm sorry, not 114,000, 118,000, my bad. And so this Conservative Commonwealth Coalition, and, and what they did is, is they spent some money defending uh, certain people in their seats, including uh, Killian Timoney, uh, that includes um, Michael Meredith down in Bowling Green, uh, but they also funded other people in elections. They funded uh, uh, an election there against Bill Wesley, incumbent, they funded a uh, campaign against Savannah Maddox, incumbent, Steve Doan, incumbent, uh, Candy Masseroni, incumbent, uh, Felicia Rayborn, incumbent, um, Marion Proctor, incumbent. And so they funded, uh, they also funded in the open primary, uh, TJ Roberts versus Ed Massey. They funded Ed Massey. And so one, they, they came in, they got involved in eight, maybe nine races. Uh, lost every single one of them, but one. They were only able to defend like one incumbent, and then they weren't able to even come close to taking down any of the incumbents they tried to go after, or did they try to? Uh, uh, nor, or, nor did they win an open seat or take down anybody they went after because they went after, uh, like I said, Bill Wesley and all them. D- they won fine, and then some of the people they were trying to defend, such as Killian Timoney such as, you know, uh, uh, Richard Heath, well, they lose, incumbents lose, badly, in, in Killing Timoney's case. And, and by the way, in those races that the Conservative Commonwealth Coalition got involved into, they outspent their opponents like five to one, 10 to one in the Killing Timoney race, more than 10 to one, and they lost. They lost badly because clearly the people they're supporting, the incumbents they're supporting, are the bad ones are the liberal ones, are the ones that when you tell the truth, what you're trying to spend money of to get past is the truth. Because the truth is still worth something. How much is it worth? That depends on the race, of course, and everything else. But the truth is still worth something. And especially in house races, (coughs) where the voting block is only about 3,000 people most of the time, it doesn't take much to make sure they all know the truth. And because the truth is so easily backed up by facts and and is so clear and can be so obviously shown, it's really hard to fight it when it's only 3,000 people. And so because of that, this PAC that spent hundreds upon hundreds of almost, if not more than a million dollars 
trying to take on good conservative uh, representatives that are incumbents in the House, on top of that, trying to defend incumbents in the House, they lost over and over and over again because the truth has too much value. But so this pack, based upon their behavior, clearly was a pack. I mean, it was funded by the teachers unions. That should give you a pretty good idea of what the pack was for. Now, there's a quote unquote unspoken rule, right, where the, the House and Senate leadership are not supposed to take down incumbents. You do have things that they do, such as, uh, you know, Adrian Southworth, for example, they redistricted her to make sure she would lose her primary, put her in a difficult position. Um, you know, they may do things like, uh, you know, individually uh, donate money to opponents or get involved in open primaries. But one of the things they're not supposed to do, supposedly, is go against their incumbents, especially not directly, because it causes a real breakdown. Because when we look at it, so we've got Bill Wesley, uh, Savannah Maddox, Felicia Rayborn, Steve Doan, Marion Proctor, Candy Massaroni, um, incumbents, I believe... Kenny Massaroni, is that all of them? Jo- Josh Calloway, I don't think they really went after Josh Calloway through Julie Cantwell. She's, I don't, I don't think she was a good enough opponent for them. I saw six, maybe seven-ish. So six of the caucus members, you tr- that pack goes after directly. And now we find out the House GOP Caucus Campaign Committee, which, by the way, was originally created to be used... For Republicans, and the Democrats have a version of this, but the House Republicans to use that money in order to win general election races, period. Then they started using it in the primaries where they said, well, we're just using this to defend our incumbents. And that was their thing. They're like, well, we're just defending our incumbents. This is just what we do with our money. We just defend the incumbents. You know, he's one of us or she's one of us, so we're going to defend them. Then they started using the money in open seat primary, saying, well, look, you know, we're not going against an incumbent. But up until now, it's been pretty faux pas, pretty taboo to actively spend money out of the caucus campaign committee against an incumbent. And part of the reason why is because the money raised into that fund comes from, one, other House members putting money into it, so going out to their their donors base, asking them to go ahead and put money into it. Two, as a group, they're all supposed to take part in fundraising activities, put funds into uh, that campaign account. And then also, um, keep in mind, leadership is voted on by the rest of the members of the body. And so leadership is also in charge of this caucus campaign committee. And if it's found out, well, you're spending a bunch of money against incumbents, that's going to create a lot of issues amongst the sitting members because they're sitting there saying, look, I've been helping raise money into that account or, you know, that account is supposed to, you know, when I go in and by helping raise money, it could be just how they're voting because they're told, look, if you go ahead and you vote for XYZ bill and that helps out this corporation, well, they'll go ahead and kick us back 10 grand into this account. So go ahead and spend money on these corporations and, and, and or give your votes to these corporations and it will help our bottom line. So there's more ways to raise money than actively raising money, but just voting how you're told. But now if the, the flip side is, is, oh, by the way, we're going to openly now go against incumbents with these funds. You're talking about a complete breakdown. This is a step too far. And what they did is they provided $118,000 of in-kind contribution to the Conservative Commonwealth Coalition in polling. So they let that $118,000 worth of polling data to a pack taking down six, seven, eight or so incumbents. This, I think, is a step too far. I think this is the kind of thing that causes a open civil war within the House Republican caucus. So instead of fighting against contracts like this, spending your time attacking the, 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 you know, stopping from funding the Democrat beliefs. Because here's the other thing that happens, right? When you're over here approving contracts like these DEI contracts for panorama education, you're funding the teaching of ideology 
that you are also going to try to fight against. An ideology that says Republicans are bad. So instead of looking long term and saying, you know, we're going to be taken out by this activities that we're doing, because instead of paying attention to how we're literally funding the Democrats attacking us and funding ideologies that the Kentucky people currently don't agree with, that's why the Democrats are in such a minority in both the House and Senate, because Kentuckians as a whole don't agree with their ideologies. So instead of spending tax dollars funding a convincing campaign, funding a a psychological campaign to convince everybody to go ahead and be okay with their ideas, they're spending money in fighting. I, I just should be ashamed of that. You wonder why it's feckless. People are like, what do we do? What do we do about these contracts they're passing that you talk about? What do we do? Well, stop letting your vote be bought by one, cheap ads and cheap mailers, and two, stop pretending like your house rep's your friend. They're not. Most of them are not your friend. They're liars. And if they're not liars, if, if they are doing the right thing, then they should be willing to talk to you about these things. And they should be the ones openly calling these things out. If you go on my socials, you will find, when I post things like about these contracts and other things, you'll find senators and state house reps liking, commenting, sharing these types of things. That tells you they're probably pretty good because they recognize the problem. And they'll be asking the questions. But those who are standing up for you like that, they're going to be the ones that have and, and, and face the most opposition in the primaries from their own party because they're like, oh, you're rocking the boat too much. When, and, and they don't see that the boat that you're rocking is headed towards the end of, of conservatism in the state, the end of the Republican uh, uh, majority in the state because you're funding the campaign to convince people to vote for Democrats. It's like you're heading towards a cliff and you're yelling at the people who are like, hey, we need to turn this boat around. And instead of, you know, turning the boat around, paying attention to the maps, listening to what they're saying, instead you're trying to throw them out of the ship. <clears throat> Absolutely ridiculous. It needs a change. If they want to see a difference, it needs a change. Here's a final story for you. The Democrat Party has said here in Kentucky that they're not revealing the names of the DNC delegates uh, that are coming out of Kentucky for safety reasons, safety reasons. Um, So the way this works, the party gets together through a convoluted and longer process to actually vote for who ends up becoming their national, uh, uh, their federal delegates to go up and cast their vote for who's the president. Now in this case with Kamala Harris and Joe Biden and everything else, Uh, Joe Biden has removed himself from the ballot, of course, we know that. And so these people are going up there to go ahead and uh, cast the actual deciding vote for who will be the Democrat nominee for president, the potential next president of the United States. Now, in Kentucky, there is state law that binds binds a delegate's votes to whomever has won the primary. However, when the person who's won the primary has backed out, it's now down to that delegate to decide, which makes hiding their identity literally like the craziest thing to me because you're hiding the identity of the few people, you know, there's like maybe a few hundred. I I, I don't know how many the DNC has exactly. I know for the Republicans, you have delegates and then you've got alternate delegates and stuff, Um, but it's a handful. It's really not a lot of people. And they're, so you're hiding their identity of who's going to go and actually pick who may be the next president of the United States. The few handful of people from Kentucky that are picking the DNC nominee are doing so secretly without revealing their name. That sounds pretty anti-democratic to me. And they say they're doing this because they're worried about their safety. Worried about their... What are they talking about? Worried about their safety. What, what? Worried about safety from who? Other Democrat protesters? We see what's going on at that DNC convention. The people marching and concerning uh, uh, Democrat elector safety is far left, pro-Palestine, pro-Hamas protesters. It's not Republicans. They've never... What are you talking Fear of their safety. Absolutely ridiculous. 
ridiculous. And But what do you expect from the party that's just, you know, there to protect democracy, of course. Well, y'all, that's what we've got time for today on the Andrew Cooperwriter Show. We'll be back here tomorrow. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Hope you share this with others, as always. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you leave a review. Till tomorrow, we'll be seeing you.